So uh, I think you can uh, already uh, share your screen. See that it's all yep. working. Let's see that it's all uh, working well. And then I'll, I'll start and uh, introduce you and, uh, and uh, the plan we have for today. So I'll, I, I think I'll start by uh, saying a few words actually, um, while uh, Chris is, uh, is checking that the screen sharing is working and everything. Um, the, the purpose for, for this meeting and this, this tutorial that we're doing now is that uh, over the last couple of years, um, a new programming language has been developed and Chris will say more about it. It's called Julia. I think some of you heard about it. And during the time I did my postdoc at MIT, I saw how it was growing, the, uh, catching more and more popularity and being uh, more significant and important uh, for uh, a lot of different uh, goals, both in the world of AI, but specifically from my point of view in the world of photonics and uh, quantum physics. And then when uh, we built a graduate class that we ran over last winter, we decided to also take a part of the class to learn a little bit more of Julia and its applications in the world of quantum optics. And we thought this is something that will be interesting for more people at Technion. And before uh, we arranged this tutorial uh, with two speakers, one is, uh, is, is Chris that will be talking more about Julia and the, the way it went, and more about what we can do with it. I think it was valuable for people coming from different fields. And the second half will be given by Sutapa. She's a PhD student that will be, uh, that was worked with, with Julia and will explain about his applications for uh, quantum information um, and quantum optics. So let me start by introducing Chris. Chris, we can, I can see our screen, but not your slides. Um, yeah, well, I, I was gonna do a lot of live, live coding here, so. Oh, that's um, better. So I'll, we'll, we'll do this. I'll just say a few words about Chris's uh, background. Um, I don't know if many of you know him, but Chris uh, Rekakis is, is an applied mathematician and an applied mathematics instructor at MIT. He's also a senior research scientist at the University of Maryland and also a director of scientific research at Pumas AI. And in the Julia Award, which is, I think we're going to hear more about, is he's very well known as the lead developer of SciML. That's one of the largest Julia organizations. Um, he also received numerous awards for being one of the most prolific package developer in the world of Julia. Um, and he brought uh, the Julia-based Puma software to become a critical infrastructure accelerating current clinical trials for essential vaccines. There, are, there is much more to, to say, but I think having this hands-on uh, tutorial is something that uh, will be very interesting for us to see. And I'm looking forward to it. So thanks for uh, coming, Chris. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so um, w what I'm going to be uh, starting this based off of is I, I gave a workshop, a quarter weekly workshop series for a few years. Um, if you search for Intro to Julia, um, it'll it'll come right up um, as the ECI data uh, data science initiative um, intro to Julia. So I'm going to be kind of going in broad strokes through through the same thing as uh, th this introduction to Julia. Um, though it's not going to be exactly the same. And the first thing that I always like to start with is tooling, documentation, and community, right? Because the the most essential thing for using a language, especially a new language, is you have to know how to get help, right? Um, so if you're going to use Julia, where, where do you get help? What, what do you do, right? So um, probably the, the largest source of, um, of community for the Julia community, you can find it on Discourse. And so if you go to discourse.julialang.org, this will bring you to the, to the Discourse site. And if you have any questions, this is the main place to ask all your questions. Um, you know, people are on here asking questions every few minutes, right? And people are giving answers as, as well. So if, if you're new to the Julia world, um, feel free to use this. There is a first steps category. So, you know, if you, if you feel like your question is something that is, you know, like the very first step, like, you know, what, how do integers work, right? Feel completely free to you know ask a question along those lines. That's what that's what this this whole this category is for. So um so the first the first thing to know is really just like here here is where the main community is. Um, if you go to slackinvite.julialang.org, um, let me actually open a chat window here and, and throw these in there. Um, so discourse. Uh, dot julialang.org is the first one, Slack invite dot julialang.org is the other. Um, that brings you to the Julia Slack. And the Julia Slack is a um, is a organization that has now more than 
7,500 uh, 7, people who are discussing about Julia daily, right? So um, the nice thing about the Julia Slack is you actually find a lot of the people who build the major packages and Julia itself are all tend to be on the Slack. So um, we have a channel for diff differential equations where people are discussing, for example, you know, he here, you know, I, I just woke up because it's 8.30 in, in US time. And here's a question about using the differential equation solver, which I will answer, you know, in 20 minutes or actually like an hour or so, right? And so you can find all sorts of channels. Um, there, there's random channels. There's also help desk channels for just general help. If you don't know where, where to look, you know, so this is this is the general conversation that people are having about using Julia and getting help with Julia. So um, these are these are two community resources. I would really uh, think that if, if you wanna be using uh, Julia daily, these are very helpful resources to know about. So tooling, uh, so the, the key to really starting a new language, right, is tooling, documentation, and community. Those are your those are your two community sites, right? There are, there are a lot of all the other smaller sites like the Julia Reddit, um, the Julia Stack Exchange. These, you know, if you're familiar with with Stack Exchange or Reddit, you can use these as well. But um, the, the core ones really are the discourse and and the Slack. This is where you'll find most people. So um, the next thing is documentation, right? So um, where do you find the relevant documentation to really get started with Julia? Well, so the the um, the core documentation is docs.julialang.org, and um, so the, the 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 real nice thing about Julia is that its manual is fairly complete. So um, if if you're just getting started, I would say that the manual is a good place to start. And most people who are learning Julia are learning it as a second language, right? So, are, so if you already know one other language, the, the page to go for is noteworthy um, differences from other languages. If you Google it, it'll pop right up. This page right here is precisely the one that I think that if you're new to this language and you already know how to program, this is the page to start with, right? It basically just says, if you know MATLAB, this is why Julia. This is how Julia is different. If you know R, this is how Julia is different. If you know Python, this is how Julia is different. Right? It just walks through one base indexing versus zero. This syntax equals this syntax. You know, the, these are the things that that people have shown that who are, have used Python before. This is what they've seen is different, and this is just a bullet by bullet list of things to keep in mind. Um, so th this is like this. This is really what I think is like the go-to page. Um, the, you know, there's a page describing everything else. Going through a full manual can be difficult, but I think that th this is like the, this is a good starting point if you're um, if you're just getting started. I think that someone does need to move their microphone there. Yeah. Um, so okay, so okay. Um, what are some other documentation pieces that you should know about in the general community? Um, one that I find that is very helpful is the uh, Julia Wiki book. Right, so the Julia Wiki book is an unofficial uh, project, but I have found it to be um, fairly good for a, a, a such a project. Um, for example, if, if you go to the Julia Wiki book, um, if you go to working with text files, it has a bunch of live code for, you know, if you copy paste this in, this is working code that you can utilize and then extend from. So the Wiki book is, is a fairly good resource. Um, a, another resource, you know, so then there's always package documentation and all that. And the one last resource I really like to point to people to is the um, is the Quanticon cheat sheet. So if you haven't seen the Quanticon cheat sheet before, uh, if you just uh, search for Quanticon cheat sheet, this cheat sheet is a sheet which shows MATLAB, Python, and, and, and Julia right next to each other. So you know, you can see, you know, here here's how you make an, a row vector in MATLAB. Here's a row vector in Julia. Here's a row vector in Python. It's fairly complete going through a lot of uh, linear algebra. So, you know, if you're doing this for scientific computing, especially in the quantum world, you know, if, if you want to know how do you take conjugate transposes and everything, this is all described line by line right next to it. So if you know one language, go into the next one is fairly easy. I also like showing this off because, you know, it's, it's a nice showcase of the Julia syntax, where if you look at, at almost every single line here, you get a bunch of extra junk in Python, you get, you know, less junk in, in MATLAB, and the Julia syntax is really just straight and to the point. Um, and the, what, the, what I'll be describing a little bit is how it's able to be straight to the point, and what what, what extra features are you getting from there. So th those, I think, are, are the, the key 
extra resources um, that I'd like to point to. I do point people to the um, the workshop notes that I wrote here, mostly because even though parts of this are old, if you're very interested in getting into the language, I always think that um, having the right problems to work from are, are really good. And this has basic problems, intermediate problems, advanced problems. Um, so for example, create a string matrix. And all of these have, all of these problems do have um, answers associated with them as well. Right, so it's a problem and answer sheet that goes through basic problems in scientific computing. What's more to want, right? So if you know if you, if you feel like you need to get an introduction to language, try solving some of these problems. Um, so so okay, so so that's the basics of the language, right? Um, to, so let's see, tooling, documentation, and community. So the last portion of that is tooling, right? So the the basic way that you can use Julia is through the REPL. Um, so I know that a lot of people use a REPL in a text editor and just copy paste it in the REPL. That's one fine way to use it. Um, I also generally use Atom, though I will have to say that for some reason, uh, unfortunately timed, I, get, I got an update this morning and I think that it's not connecting right now. So instead of working through that, I'll just be working through the REPL today, this morning. But uh, Juno is one of the most widely used um, uh, IDEs. And if you're if you're familiar with Atom, it's a text editor. You what you do is you take you go to Juno, you go to the um, settings, and then or and then when you go to install, you install a package. And this package for it is Julia um, or Uber Julia, Uber dash Julia. And when you install this this Julia client, then or Uber dash Juno, then it becomes a full Julia. Um, I, IDE, right? So you just, if you just label something with a .jl, you get this whole syntax highlighting, you get inline evaluation. And if you watch any of these videos that I have um, on, on YouTube for parallel computing and scientific machine learning, you'll see that it's all done with Juno. It's it's a very popular IDE for the Julia programming language. Um, the other IDE that people are really getting started with is uh, VS Code. So this is the one that's kind of moving forward. If you haven't seen Visual Studio Code, um, you can use this remotely. Um, so right there, it is trying to actually connect to remote, but I'm not VPNing right now. So you, you can actually use VS Code in such a way that um, that it's always connected directly to a cloud computer or to a um, a cluster. Um, so that way, you, all of everything that you run is, for example, this is set up to be running with 128 cores by default. Um, and and then what you can do is you know you can just use Julia from VS Code, which is a full um, which is a full text editor in its own right, right? So you, you know if if you def if you open up something like um, a .jl file, oh it's still trying to go to my SSH. Um, closer. Yeah, so so if you open something like a a, a .jl file, you'll find that it is appropriately syntax highlighted and everything as well, right? So um, then you can copy paste things, or or what you can do is you can like type two plus two, and then if you highlight it and you do Control Enter, what it will do is you know here here's a um, new version of it running locally, so you can see, but uh, it will install the VS Code server and directly run the Julia REPL from here, right? So um, Juno is probably what I still prefer um, until maybe this morning because uh, stuff that happened there. But um, but going forward, the Juno developers have actually moved to VS Code. So if you're just getting started, using VS Code might be um, a good place to start. So um, I will say it doesn't have feature parity with uh, with with Juno yet, but um, it it is like a it, it is probably the preferred way to get started here. So let me just uh, increase the size of um, of my REPL, so that way it's a better showcase for online here. So okay, so the the, the ways to get started with these IDEs is to, I mean, I, I think the most important thing is always to know the um, the keyboard commands, right? So if you if you're using Juno, you go to docs.junolang.org and um, at docs.junolang. Or oops, sorry, I autocorrected that to the wrong one. Docs.juno uh, Juno, lab.org. So in docs.junolab.org, um, after, after you get installed, you go to basic usage, and right there is most of the keyboard commands that you want to know about. Um, if you go to VS Code, oh, I, I did forget to mention how you install the VS Code extension. It's fairly straightforward. Um, you go to view, you go to extensions, and then you just look for the Julia extension and it'll pop right up. All right, so um, 
it just just like with with Atom, this is an extension to an existing text editor library, and so you can find all sorts of other extensions on here as well. Um, for example, um, embedding Python into Julia, you can get special syntax highlighting for if you do something like Py. You know, if, you, if you're doing using PyJulia, um, you you can call Python within Julia, and then you can get the the Python syntax highlighting directly from within the embedded Python. Right, so you can install all sorts of um, extensions in the same place where you install the VS Code one. To get more documentation on the VS Code extension for Julia, um, you just search for VS Code Julia and you'll have the GitHub pop right up. Um, and so uh, uh, in, in this documentation, you'll find that, you know, the, the, it, it defines everything for, for this extension, such as how do you run code and what are the um, associated, um, what, what, what are the associated keyboard commands. So what, what I'm showing here to get started is just the way to copy things down into your REPL automatically is you just hold control, you hit enter, and that throws it down to the REPL. If you want to do the inline evaluation, then you hit, uh, you hold alt and you hit enter, and there you go. Now it's going to be evaluating in there. I like doing the inline evaluation mostly because you can kind of keep a keep tabs and keep a history of, of what you what you've been showing. Though it's it is a very um, choice thing. So I mean. Um, Let's see, let, let, let me uh, remove a, a view here. And um, there. all right, so, uh, so okay, so let, let's get started with Julia using v, the VS Code ID here. So this is one of the standard choices these days. So let's get, just get started here, right? So Julia it, um, it has a array syntax very similar to uh, MATLAB. If you go through the quant econ sheet sheet, you know, side by side, you, you can, quite clearly see this. So for example, here, here is the array of one, two, three. I do inline evaluation, and it tells me that this is an array of integers of one, right? So um, learning how to read it appropriately is I think a, a useful tool, right? So the, the, the way, what this is called is it's called a parametric type. So it's a type which has the, the concrete value. So the, it is an array, and then it has essentially arguments to the type. So this is an array that is of integers and uh, with one dimension, right? So usually if, if you if you see this curly bracket, I like to read it as of, right? Um, so this is an array of integers. And if I'm to change this to be, you know, 3.0, you see that I get an array of floating point values. Um, and if you change this to be array of string with a high in there, then you have an array of anything, right? And so this, this will promote around so that way it can hold whatever you're going to be trying to put inside of there. Um, and if I do something like a of one equals uh, high two, you'll see that this is going to work out because this is an array that can hold anything. Oops. Yeah, so this is an array that can hold anything. Um, the inline evaluation is doing something funny there. So, uh, so you can see that when when I do evaluate this, you know, I can change things around back and forth to be different types. Um, and because this is an array that holds anything, right? So if if I do have an array that that holds, you know, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, then um, then this is something that has float 32 or float 64 in there. If I try to put this same value inside of here, what do you think is going to happen? you get an error. And what does this error say? I cannot convert a string uh, to an object of type uh, float64. Why does it want to try to convert it to float64? Because this is an array of float64, right? So, you know, when, when you say, so your objects all have different types associated with them and the types that are associated with them matter. So this is probably the first thing that you kind of see when you're using the Julia language that um, not everything goes all the time, right? So in, the way that I like to describe Julia is that, or the way that I'd like to describe programming languages is that talking to C is kind of like talking with a philosopher, right? Talking with a philosopher, you have to, you, you say, you know, hey, how, how, how's your morning? And, you know, the philosopher will ask you, define morning, does morning exist, right? Like, you know, with C, you have to start from the absolute basics. Um, when you're t dealing with Python, you're kind of talking with a politician, right? When, when you say something like, um, when, when, when you say something like two to the uh, 0 0.5, right? Like, you know, minus 0 0.5, the, the, this is an integer to a floating point power. So, um, uh, so this this case actually auto promotes. But uh, so, so you know, some, sometimes Python will kind of just say, well, you know, here you, I did minus two to, you know, to a floating point, uh, to a, you know, minus floating point power. Does this thing work? 
um, no, uh, it doesn't actually exist inside of the floating point numbers, but something like Python or MATLAB will, will try to make you happy all the time, right? So they'll kind of be like, oh, you, we know what you want to do. You know, we're going to hide what goes on in the background and change this around. Julia is more explicit about types. So here we have minus two to the um, two of power, right? Um, if, you know, from mathematics, you know that this is going to be an imaginary number. And Julia says, you, you're you writing a non-imaginary number to a power. If you want this to be an imaginary number, you should say that you want this to be an imaginary number, right? So w the way that I like to think about uh, talking with Julia is that it's like talking with a scientist, right? Essentially, the, you, you can use shorthands all the time, but there is a very concrete language which is going on underneath. The, this concrete language is, is written in terms of types. Um, and if you violate things about types, that uh, if you violate the rules with types, you'll get an error about what, what, what's happening there. Right? So here the, the error is essentially um, th this exponentiation operation in order to be type stable, um, it, it is written as an operation such that you know, floating point values and integers to floating point values will output a float 64. So it is a function of float 64 to, uh, and plus float 64 to float 64. Here, there is no floating point 64 number that represents the output of this mathematical function. So it tells you that. It doesn't just automatically change your type, right? So, so you know, um, so why does Julia not change your type around? That, that, is, that is the fundamental question um, about how Julia is kind of different from these other programming languages, right? So why doesn't it just always allow you to put high inside of a string, you know? And, and the, the key idea here is that Julia has an optimizing compiler underneath the hood, right? So when I do, you know, this is an array of float 64s, what Julia is going, then going to do is it's going to optimize on the fact that th this is something that has a layout that has three numbers that are 64 bits, and it's going to then inline all those bits right next to each other. Um, so if, if you actually look at the representation in Julia, this is efficient, right? So if you want to understand something like what is the Julia equivalent to a NumPy array, this is the, this is the Julia equivalent to a NumPy array. What is the equivalent to a Python list? This is the equivalent to a Python list. And the reason why Julia is able to do this, you know, and basically use one construct to be able to handle all these cases is because of this type system, right? In a sense, you have enough information here to know that what, you know, what, if, if you know, the, the array itself is a pointer to a piece in the memory, um, at what point it does, what does A of three point to? Right, this is a question that you can know the answer to without having to actually loop through the array. Right, you you know that the the value that you're going to read is going to be at bit 128 because that this is has everything be flow 64. Right, um, what do, what happens in this case? Well, this what happens in this case is it falls back to be being very dynamic. Right, so Julia is a dynamic programming language. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that it only goes to dynamic when it needs to. So for example, if, you, if you, this case is essentially statically compiled, where in this case, what it's doing is it's going to say, this is an array of, of pointers where it doesn't necessarily know where all the information lives. So it creates an array of pointers to data that are all living on, um, on your computer. And the, that has basically the same representation of what happens in Python, right? So when types are known, then you have something that's efficient, right? When types are unknown, then you have something that's less efficient, but things just work, right? So th this, this is really the key to Julia, that ty types are what's underlying the optimization and the efficiency of the language. So the, the, co uh, so the core to using to Julia is really the function level, right? Because everything that you're doing is JIT compiled. And where Julia uh, does this compilation process is on the function itself. So how do you define a function? You say something like f of x, y. Um, this is 2x plus y. And if you're familiar with other languages, you, you might want to use return statements here. The one thing that you'll find is that a lot of people in Julia do functional programming styles. One of the things that is done in a functional programming style is that you use implicit returns. So you just say, whatever is the last command that is executed, that is a thing that we will return. So here, for example, is a function definition. Um, if I do f of two 
uh, 3, you'll see that it outputs 7, which is an integer. And if I do f of 2.03, you'll see that it outputs 7.0, uh, which is a floating point number. So this function right here is what's known as a generic function. Um, there are different functions which are called whenever you have different inputs. And when I, what, I, what I mean is that, you know, it's not just that are different functions that are called, there are, there are actually different signatures and assembly language which are called underneath the hood for different functions. So here's something you'll never see inside of a, um, a you know, other high level language. Let's do code LLVM. Uh, f of two three. So here I can directly inspect what the what the um, assembly language is going on under the hood when I do a call of f of two three, and you can see that what it's saying is that this is a function which takes in an integer and an integer, and then it out it does an integer um, it does an integer multiply against a constant, and then it does an integer add operation here, right? So this is something that it, it has compiled a function which is specific to integers, and that is what it's calling here. Um, so how does that work when we do f2.03? Well, we can see directly from the uh, we, we can see directly from the um, source code here, the the assembly code, that what it does is it takes this two and it up promotes it to be a double, um, you know, a, flo a double precision floating point number. And then it does the uh, floating point uh, multiplication against that number, and then it does the floating point add against this number, right? So, note note that you know this is this is an interesting thing here, right? That we wrote down one function, right? This is one function in Julia, but it's actually multiple different assembly languages which are optimized for each of the different inputs that you put in there. So this is something that's called function specialization. So types are not just something that is a small detail of the language, but Types are actually essential to how the language itself is optimizing. And essentially, the way to think about this is that whenever you call a function in Julia, it'll auto-specialize on the concrete types that you're putting in there. So here is a function that is you know, just written such that anything goes. I could put anything in there. But when it sees that I have a version, or when, when it sees that I'm putting a double, a, a double precision float in there and an integer in there, then it will use a specifically compiled version of that for the double precision floats and the integers I put in there, All right? Um, so, so everything in the Julia programming language is based on this. And so there's, a, there's this idea of type stability, right? So if I do two to the five, then um, what comes out of there is something that is a, you, you get a, you know, th this, this caret function is implemented in Julia as a function that is, you know, strictly typed on these integers. And you know that, it, that, uh, uh, caret of an integer to an integer is always going to put out a integer. Um, and so this means that you can start to look at the, these, these functions which are comp composing things, right? So, um, so, uh, you know, for the, so for example, in, in this function, when I put a floating point number in and a, um, and a integer in, then you can start to run through the inference algorithm and know what all your types are throughout it. Right, so if, I, if I, I can actually show you what Julia sees here, so at Julia code uh, warn type um, f of 2.03, you, know, you, you can see that it sees that f is a floating point number and y is a floating point number. When you do a multiplication between a 2 and an x, then you get a floating point number that comes out. And when you take the output of that and then you add y to that, um, you get a floating point number because this is a float plus a integer. Right, so you can kind of run through the algorithm and see, you know, so these 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 algorithms are are hard coded in such a way that they're known as type stable, which means that whenever you have a floating point, whenever you have the, the multiplication between an integer and a floating point number, you always have a float sixty four that comes out, and so the compiler knows that that what what is here is a floating point number, and so then because it already knows what's the floating point number there, it can infer what the next operation is, the next operation, and so you essentially have the this, this property that if you have functions where you can know beforehand what the what the um, type that's coming out is going to be, then the compiler can optimize everything for you. So th this is where Julia gets the reputation. It's, it's well-deserved reputation that it is fast, right? Because if you actually look at the code that I've been showing you, there is no difference between this, the, the assembly language here, right? Like if I actually do code um, assembly or uh, code native, um, f of 2.03, right? You can look through this and you can see that you just pop and then you do, do your, um, your floating point power and then you put it back, right? There's nothing between, there's no difference 
between the floating point operations that are going on here, the assembly language um, that is hand that Julie is building here, and the assembly that uh, C or 4chan compiles to. So Julia is not slower than C or 4chan here. It is giving the exactly the same floating point operations and is doing the exact same thing underneath the hood on, on the bare metal, right? And the reason why it does this is because of the type system. Um, the reason why people say, you know, the reason why people give Julie a little bit of leeway and say, you know, maybe it's like two times, you know, maybe the speed, you know, maybe C is like two times faster every once in a while. Um, the reason why people give it that leeway is because whenever you fall back to this dynamic behavior, you do lose these op optimizations, right? Because if, if you think about it, um, here is an array where at, at the type information, all that you know is that you have anything in there. And so if you're to pull a of one out of this array, you don't generally know what the type is. So the first thing you'd have to do is you have to do a type check to be able to understand what kind of type this is before you continue your next operations. So Julia is an automatically optimizing language where once everything about the, the system has known types or has a function that is specialized on known types, then it is able to build something that is as efficient as the C code or the C++ code or the Fortran code. It's, it's no slower because it's exactly the same um, assembly language or the, the assembly, exactly the same thing that's actually being called in the computer under the hood. Um, if you want to know more about this aspect of um, of optimizing your your code for the Julia programming language, um, I, what I would point to is actually some of my recent lecture notes. Um, so if you go to the uh, MIT um, eighteen three three seven course, so this is eighteen three three seven parallel computing and scientific machine learning. It's a course for graduate students, but we do have some undergraduates who are taking the course. Um, very early in this in this course, we do go through um, this portion on how do you optimize serial code. And you'll, you'll find that there are YouTube lectures on this. And so you can go through the YouTube lecture if you want. Um, and the this goes directly through how do you go through everything from optimizing your heap allocations um, to how do you make sure you handle types in a way that you're always building efficient code. What are the things that can go wrong? What is type stability? How do you use multiple dispatch come into play? All these details are outlined in, in, this, in this lecture. So I'll leave this. Uh, I'll leave the three hour lecture on performance to the pre-recorded one here. Um, but so so one one key thing that comes out of this though is that Julia and its functions are really built on this idea that when you put different types in, you can essentially have different functions. Um, so so for example, if you, this is actually taken to its core, right? So in, in the compiler, this is always done that when you change types, you get a different function underneath the hood. This is also exposed to you as the core paradigm called um, multiple dispatch. So if I create a function call here, let's see if I can, let me do this a little bit smaller. Yeah, so if, if I have this be, um, let's see, x squared minus y, All right? So if I have this be a function of float 64, uh, float 64, this is the syntax to say, if the input types are anything, then this is the function that you call. If the input types are float 64s, then this is the function you can call. So let's let's look at the behavior here. If I do f of 2.03, this is a floating point and a integer, and so it doesn't match this function right here. Um, but so it says this is going to be 2x plus y, and we get 2 times 2 plus 3 equals 7, right? Now, if we do some, if we do 2.0, this what it will do is it will look for the 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 method that matches your function most concretely, right? So, you know, here's a flow 64 and a flow 64, and so this method is a more concrete system, uh, a more concrete dispatch than this one. So, therefore, what it what it will do is it'll call this dispatch and it'll run the function x squared minus y, right? So, un under the hood, Julia is always calling what's known as different methods for a given function based off of the input types, right? So th this function itself is generic and it will change depending on what what um, input types are, but it will be the same kind of, it's the same template that is put inside of each of these places. Here we've now grabbed control of that system and said, but if it is an FO64 and FO64, then call this function. So you, there's a whole type to, uh, dispatch uh, hierarchy to know about. So for example, um, if you want to know super types of, um, of FO64, 
you can see that you know you have a float 64. It is an abstract float, which is a real number, which is a number, which is an any. And so you can see the super types of uh, complex. You know it falls under a hierarchy here as well. Um, if you look into the Julia number types inside of the inside of the documentation, you'll find a picture of the um, of the hierarchy. Let me pull this over. Um, if you if you look at the uh, floating point number types here, you'll find a picture of this hierarchy. Um, I did not instantly find it, so I'll look at Google Images, and here it is right here. Right, so you you can see that there there is this hierarchy where um, at the very bottom you have you know the concrete types, and then all of your integer types are part of abstract float. So, for example, um, oh, where did that go? So, so big float, float 16, float 32, float 64 are abstract floats, which are all real numbers, which are, you know, numbers are, goes for complex and real, right? So I, I can do another de designation here, and I can say, for example, I want my function, this version or this method of the function f um, is going to be on number um, float 64, or I'm going to do number uh, number, and um, I want this one just to be x plus y. So if, if you just put two numbers in there, you get x plus y. And so if I do this now, then 3.02 will be x plus y instead of um, 2x plus y. What happens if I put a floating point, to floating point and floating point number in there? It will still call um, this version right here because this one is more concretely typed than the other one, right? So um, you know, if if we look at this, if we look at this hierarchy, we see that float 64 is lower down in the hierarchy than number, and so therefore, if it matches to be float 64, then you will have you call the version that is for directly float 64s. Right now, what happens if we let, 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 let's actually put an, another change in here? Right, so let, let's say we have um, uh, float 64 and uh, let, let, let's make it so that way there's there's a case where there's not a strict hierarchy, right? So you do on uh, flow 64 and number where you have um, uh, 4x plus y, and we do a case where we have uh, flow 64 and um, number, and we do uh, 6 of uh, uh, 6x plus y, and now we do a case where we say um, f of uh, 2 plus m for an imaginary number and 2.0, right? So, uh, so actually found a hierarchy here. I'm trying to think of an example for this on on the fly. So sorry, sorry about that. Um, so essentially, if if you build it so that way, you don't directly match where something is going to be the the lowest uh, value. So let me see if there's a way to to take this example of building and do this, um, you'll get an ambiguity error. And basically what an ambiguity error means is that you know, you, you've defined this in such a way that in, in some sense, this is a lower dispatch than another. And you have, an, oh, I, I see why I, this example didn't work. So, so let me define a new function G here. So I have this function and then I have, um, then I have this version of the function, which is going to be number and float 64. Right, so if you have a float 64 and a number, then you call here. If you have a number and a float 64, you call here. And so these are my two versions of G. So what happens if I call G of 2.0, 3.0, right? Well, it both matches this signature and it matches this signature. Um, which one is lower in the hierarchy? Well, there, this one is more concrete than this one. This one is less concrete than this one. And so there's no clear hierarchy of, of which direction to be, right? So if you do that, this is the uh, ambiguity error. So sometimes if you, if you see an ambiguity error, this is naturally what's occurring, right? So th these are the rules to Julia Lang, right? Everything is based off the type system, is always trying to dispatch on the way that is going to be the lowest. And if it, there is no well-defined ordering on what you define, it tells you that there is no ordering, right? Like the, the, these are your two dispatches. There is no ordering which is purely lower than the other. What is the dispatch that, that is lower than both of these? Well, you it could be float 64, float 64, right? That, that would be lower, the, lower than here, that'd be lower than here, and so therefore that would be the one that is captured, right? Um, so, so that 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 is like how you work with the Julia language. It's all about the type system, and it's all about how it optimizes on on its types. If you want to learn more about making Julia fast, um, you 
can look look at that that other um, that that other uh, presentation. So what I'm going to get into now here is the uh, differential equation language. Um, so you know you can use differential equations directly, but um, I like to sometimes make use of ordinary diffie Q directly because if you only are using the ordinary differential equation solvers, it's just a mu much uh, smaller package, right? Um, the the standard documentation for the differential equation solving is um, is given at docs or diffieq.cml.ai because this is part of the scientific machine learning organization, which is covers both scientific simulation and integration of machine learning into um, in, into scientific computing. So I'm not going to go through the whole talk on what scientific machine learning is here, but essentially what you can do is you can do things like embed neural networks into differential equations to be able to use that to automatically discover missing physics where, you, uh, where you're encoding constraints. Like for example, um, I know that Schrodinger's equation is true, but I just don't know what the Hamiltonian of my system is. They automatically tell me what, you know, automatically discover the Hamiltonian. So this whole system is a, is a set of differential equation solvers, which is fully compatible with machine learning libraries to do automatic automated discovery of physical equations and automated um, machine learning based acceleration. Um, but if you just want to use it for the differential equation solvers, you'll find that you know it is an exceedingly fast differential equation solver. Um, the, the first, I would recommend that anyone who's using it for the field of differential equations goes through the first tutorial on ordinary differential equations. Most of the other tutorials assume that you've written this tutorial or read this tutor tutorial. Um, let, let me pull up the code for the Lorentz equation here. So here is the wonderful Lorentz equation that everyone knows and loves, where what you do is you, you write this in the form where you say um, dx dt equals, you know, a equation, dy dt equals an equation. So you interpret this as your vector equation, right? So here is a vector of x, y, t, um, where you say, you know, y is this, x is the first variable, y is the second variable, z is the thir third variable, and you write down a differential equation where you're saying, you know, y is the second variable, x is the first variable, and you can run through this and, and, um, and, you know, see that this this encodes that equation, right? So you, you say, you know, th this is a mutating function. So w what is the syntax with the bang, and how how is this working if it's essentially outputting nothing? Right? This is the this is a first demonstration that I think we should do. So it, it, for example, in, in Julia, um, everything is done pass by value. So if I do something like a of 1.0, 2.0, right, and then I do b equals a, and then I do um, B of one equals 100.0, and then I check A, what do you think A is going to be, right? So if this is a language like MATLAB, um, you might think that these are two different arrays, right? So if, if we look at this in Julia, these are the same array, right? So um, when, when you pass something around into different functions, um, you, you, you pass by reference, and this equality here, the equality on arrays is always by reference, which means what I'm saying, Saying here is A is 1.02. What A means. Um, if you're familiar with low-level languages like C++ or Java, th this is this is exactly how these languages work. Um, the reason for this is uh, the reason for this is essentially efficiency, right? You cannot really write highly efficient code without the ability to do mutation. Um, if you don't want this property to be true, you can put a copy in here, right? So implicitly, a lot of high-level languages, they, what they will do is they'll add a copy operation, which essentially will make this difference. So that way, A is no longer referentially uh, equated to B, right? So this is going to create a new array. Um, and it, will go, it goes into that, in, in that longer tutorial on, on performance, it goes into this detail. Um, so the differential equation library is written in a in a style that you kind of associate with uh, with C plus plus or or Fortran code for this reason of being efficient, right? So um, the it is an ODE solver that takes you know it gives you the array du um, and it tells you this is your current state, these are your current parameters, this is your current time, and what you do is you modify the the this input du in order to tell it what the derivative values are. Right, you don't create a new array. This is an arrayless operation, and and you can you can actually double check here that if I put in you know du equals rand of three, 
um, and I, if I say uh, u0 equals uh, 1.0, 1, 0, 0.0, 0, 0.0, um, and I say that uh, p, well, I'm going to have no parameters. Um, and if I say that t equals 0, 0.0, if I call this and I say f of du upt, um, or what I do, I call this Lorenz, right, uh, u0. If I call this with u0, right, so it, it, it just outputs 0, or actually I could even output make it output nothing here. Um, so so we, this is a function that, that outputs nothing. But it is still computing your differential equation because if we actually check what happened to du, it will have modified the values inside of du, right? Because th this is a mutating function. There are a lot of functions inside of Julia that are mutating. So we, we, this is a convention that if you make your own mutating function, you put a bang on there. What are some other operations that are mutating? Well, for example, you have something like um, a equals 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and then you do push into a uh, 4.0. This is an operation that will have changed the array a, right? Like it, it doesn't create a new array um, and, and point to it. It actually changes the array a to be able to add a value to it. So you'll find a lot of these operations have a, a bang on it. And here we've defined our own. This is not required for a mutating operation, but it is a convention throughout the language. Um, so, so OK, so th this is essentially what we need for the, for the ODE solver. We give it a, a, a mutating function, so that way it is a fast function. Um, we can see that it's exceedingly fast by the, the, the lectures that I point to go through this in detail. But um, if, we, if we time this, what you'll see is that this is something that essentially takes no time. Um, why does it take essentially no time? Well, most of the time that is spent in a high level language is usually about building objects and building new arrays. All right, so if you're to do an operation like um, at time uh, u, u0 dot star u0, you'll see that there's three allocations um, that takes 176 bytes and that takes uh, ends up taking most of the time. When, when you're calling this function, there's actually nothing that's being allocated. It's just flopping a few, it's, it's, it's flip flopping a few bits that are inside of an existing array, and but nothing is actually being created. And so the main overhead of a dynamic programming language is actually not seen in this kind of code. So you know you, you can think about Julia as though it is a high level language, but if you write code that is type stable, right? So using you know in a way that that will concretely go to a function underneath the hood and is written in a way such that it is mutating on existing arrays, then you're actually getting exactly the, 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 exactly the uh, performance that you'd want um, and the performance that would match something like C, C++, or Fortran. So you know, a lot of these libraries are written in a style that actually, you know, it could have been written in Fortran, but why would you write this in Fortran when you get exactly the same optimizations, right? Um, so, so okay, so here we, we define the ordinary differential equation. We say this is my input function, this is my initial condition, this is my parameters. Um, I'm going to have a t-span. I want to solve it from 0, 0.0 to 100.0. Um, so no, note that the types here do kind of matter, um, that I am putting this as a float, floating point number and a floating point number. Let me actually just omit parameters for now. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll change this around in, in a second. Um, so if I do, uh, what I do is I create this ODE problem. So I say ODE problem of, um, you know, Lorenz u0 uh, t-span, right? So this creates an ODE problem that, that encodes the information that defines the, the ODE. And now here what we do is we say, let's just solve this ODE. And let's use a method like sit5, right? So um, the documentation describes uh, all the different method choices. Here you can see that this is actually a open system, right? So I define the type for what my algorithm is and it dispatches to that algorithm. And so th this one way of specifying an ODE problem is not, is not just a way that specifies the problem for one set, set of solvers. If you look at the documentation here, you'll see um, you'll see that inside the ODE solvers, they have about 300 different methods. Um, a lot of these methods are inside the ordinary DPQ package, but you know, you'll see that sundials.jl is mentioned here. So this is a different package, which calls the sundials library. Um, this is a different package, which calls the ODE interface library. Right, so there's a lot of different packages involved in the same interface. And the way that that works is essentially just the same dispatch mechanism that I defined before. So if I do, you know, uh, if I do sundials here, 
and then I change this to CVODE BDF. If you're familiar with using C++ as uh, a CVODE method um, for, from the Sundials library, th this is the entire difference of the code to be able to use a different library for the ODE solvers. So this whole mechanism is all based off of dispatch itself too. Different dispatches of solve are bringing you to different libraries. So you know, th that brings it to one solver library, this is to another, you know, and you can change around libraries willy-nilly without actually changing anything about your ODE code because everything is using dispatches off of this function solve. Um, you'll find that a lot of uh, Julia numerical ecosystems are built in this fashion. So the optimization libraries like optim.jl, the, um, the optimization library jump, um, you know, the, the differential equation solvers, the nonlinear solvers, like a lot of these different libraries are built in this form where you have to pass in a type. And what's essentially going on here is that they there's different dispatches for solve that are running different optimi uh, different ODE solver libraries or different optimized under, underneath the hood. And if you define this, you know, you can have one function define the, the core dispatch and have other constituent libraries uh, that call out to different dispatches. So that way, you know, everything takes in a single syntax, even though there's no single package that holds that all together. So differential equations at jail is one of these kind of meta packages that brings together, you know, 20 to 30 different uh, ODs, differential equation solver libraries with SDEs and things like that. Um, so that's the core to solving an ODE in, in the language. Um, then you can bring in the plotting library. So plots.jl is a fairly nice package um, that you can pull up the documentation at, uh, if you just search for plots.jl, you'll find it at docs.junoplots.org. Um, there, there is a tutorial to, to walk through if you're, if you're if you like tutorials, though the one interesting thing about plots.jl is it does try to figure out what you, what you want it to do. And so if you look at the uh, attributes lab, uh, section, essentially this is the way to, to work with plots. You, you look at what the attributes you need are and it tells you how do you change line colors, how do you change series alphas, and you, or you, you just search through the attributes. So one of the interesting things about the, the plots.jl library is it has what's known as a recipe system. So everything in Julia is built off of types. And so what the recipe system allows someone, someone to do is it allows you to say, you know, this is the canonical change that you sh should do for my type, right? So for, for example, with the differential equation solvers, you can do plot solution. And what this will do is it will say, I understand the solution is in some sense something that holds an array. Um, I can transform the, the ODE solution to an array for you, and then I can change that to, to solution. Th there's some very cool properties about this, right? So for example, um, so let me get the plotting library for compiling. So the, the thing that takes the longest time to compile is the plotting library. So this is something that is greatly enhanced in Julia 1.6, which will be released in about two or three months from now. If you have questions about that, um, please, please let me know. So for example, so um, so the, the solution object is is a very interesting object here, right? So it, it creates this plot, but what, what is it actually creating the plot from? Um, you know, if you look at this, if you look at sol.t, you know, it, it is an adaptive time stepping method. And so it has these different time points in here and you can grab, you know, the, the fifth solution um, and that is corresponds to sol at time t. But since it is something that is a solution object, right? Um, you can also just say, I want the solution at two point at time 2.5, and it'll grab the solution at time 2.5 by using a high order interpolation. So if you if you look back at what it printed out here, it said it actually has a fourth order continuous solution over all time points, and that's what it's that's what it's actually giving you. Um, is this thing an array? Well, it's not. Yeah, you, you can see that it's not necessarily an array if I ch if I check the type of it. Um, it is an ODE solution of something ridiculous, right? Uh, but it's, it's an ODE solution, it's not an array. But what, what you can do with Julia is you can define, you know, th this, this function right here is not, it is, it is not something that's hidden from you, it's get index of, um, of sol, which is an ODE solution um, with respect to i, which is an integer. So this right here is a function Right, which under the hood calls into what well, the thing inside of the ODE solver object that is actually holding the values for it. And so it looks like it's, it's an array, even though underneath the hood, it's not really an array. And what you can do inside with the plot recipe is you can say, automatically convert this to be an array for me that then performs this change. 
right? And so the, with a plotting recipe system, you can kind of rely on, on the recipes because common Julia types have common convergence. So you can say, you know, if, if you do a solution of quaternion numbers, um, then what it'll do is it automatically convert the ODE solution into a set of an array of quaternion numbers, then it'll automatically convert the array of quaternion numbers to an array of floating point numbers, and it'll automatically plot the array, plot the array of floating point numbers because it knows how to interpret that, right? Um, so, so the, what the recipe system is, is an, is an automatic recursion of Julia types that tell you transformation rules to get you something that, that plots. Um, it is somewhat of a detail, but I think it's one of these important details because you'll see if, there are a lot of plot commands that look very simple. Um, there's a lot going on under the hood for, for why it does that. Just kind of know that there is a set of recursion that's going on. Um, if, if you look inside of the differential equation library as well, you'll find that that, that there are, uh, as part of this recipe, it defines extra syntax. So, um, so for example, um, it has this plot function section, and you'll see that it has this vars function. And so if I do something like uh, vars equals one, two, three, you'll see that we get this phase plot, which is the butterfly wings um, that you know and love, right? So wow, it created this all nice and pretty. Um, what happens if I tell it to do dense plot equals false? Um, you'll see that it's not as pretty because this is, these are actually the time points that it computed. And so it's actually using when I, when I created that plot, it's actually using the fact that it knows a continuous version of the solution and not just the um, and not just the discrete version of the solution to be able to fill in and, and do all the uh, extra plotting automatically. So, so it's actually not just plotting the values that it stepped at, it's choosing different values to, to plot at than it actually computed at. So th that shows you that there's a lot going on under the hood. Um, the, the, the details of that are, is, are, are kind of not going to fit in here. I think I'm actually at time, um, but th that's like a quick overview to the language. So um, let, let me kind of fin let me kind of finish here by saying that everything is built off of multiple dispatch, and um, everything is about generic functions. So here, here's a here's OD solver code for a float64, which is efficient as you know for, as Fortran code on float64s. Let's say I want to do something weird though, right? So let's say I want to do my, let's say I want to solve this, um, this equation with uh, arbitrary precision, right? Um, I, I want to use something like a, a ninth order integrator. So I just changed the algorithm, right? That, that's not too exciting. Um, I want to change the tolerances. So that way I have a tolerance, which is, you know, 1e e minus 20, you know, so I get 20 digits of accuracy, 20 digits of accuracy, that's not too exciting, right? But you can't get 20 digits of accuracy here because it's float 64. But you can change this. You, you can say that uh, big. this is going to be a big float. Um, yeah, so, so this is an array of big floats. So big floats are arbitrary precision numbers. They default to, um, they default to a precision of, uh, Let's see, I forget how to show the default precision, but they default to precision that is 512. And so if I run this code now, or let me also convert this to uh, big floats. So I didn't get to describing this, uh, this, this dot here, but you can turn any array operation. So, so this, this function I have here, um, 2.0, 3.0, I can change it into an operation that is element wise on an array just by putting a dot in front. So they can say, yeah, this is 2.0, 4.0, this is 3.0, 5.0, um, I can put a dot in front of this function, and now it's no longer the function on the array, it is the function to apply it element-wise to the arrays that are put in, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, run the, the conversion to big on each of the numbers inside of here, and so that turns them all into an array of big float, right? So this is now operating on floats, uh, uh, 512 bit floating point types. This is now 512 bit floating point types. Um, this is an ODE problem. This is a ninth order ODE integrator with a tolerance of, uh, of 20 digits. And there's nothing else that you have to do to your problem. It will spit out this actually kind of ridiculous uh, value. Um, and so let me, let me modify this around. I'm going to finish the equation with probably the, one of the bigger flexes you can do in this language. And that is I'm going to solve an ODE with rational numbers. Um, you can see that if we want 20 digits of accuracy, um, 
you know, there was a lot of compilation time there. Though the, the, this is a, this is doing it to 20 digits of accuracy on 512 bit floating point numbers, um, and giving you a solution that you know this is the number that you have, right? This is this is a lot more digits than you'd expect from standard floating point, and there's nothing that you have to change to your algorithm other than the input types, right? Because remember, everything will automatically convert based on the input types. So here I changed the input types to be OD solver to be big floating big uh, big numbers these these 512 big nu numbers and with the ninth order ODE solver and it will just do that right it will, it will do your computation in full 512 bits um, so so last let me uh, just do one final thing here and just showcase the um, the rational numbers uh, 0 over 1 uh, 0 over 1 um, let me do this as uh, 0 over 0 100 over 0 this one is more so for fun. The, the floating point, the big precision one, is more useful. This one just shows that you can do whatever the heck you want in the language. Um, oh, there's a trailing uh, thing here. Uh, zero divided by one. Oh, sorry, can't divide by zero. So, so let's say we, we want this to be. Um, let's say we want to solve this with rational numbers to um, with dt equals uh, one over a hundred. Uh, what, what is what is the you know the version without float, floating point error um, for the for this function? Well, you can't really do adaptive time stepping if, if you're working on a discrete space. So I'm going to make adaptive equal to false here. And here you go. It's going to turn away for a bit, and it's going to give me a solution, which is going to be a gigantic rational number. Um, actually, oh, I need. It. I'm going to need to kill that. I need to change this to rationals of big integers. But while while uh, while taking questions here, I'll, I'll um, yeah. well let, let me let me do an example here. Uh, let me just kind of show what the, the final example looks like when you uh, get that done. But basically, it, it's it's just a nice um, it's just a nice example of the type system that you know you you, you can even just say I want to use uh, uh, rational numbers and everything works out. And GitHub looks like it just went down, which is not good. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll take questions here because I'm a bit over time. So. Blows up your, uh, it blows up your your uh, rational numbers to enormous not to enormous rational numbers right now. Yeah, yeah. So you, you do have to do um, big integers on on the top yeah, here. Okay, because the the numerator and denominators are all going to be enormous. That's it. So uh, let's uh, actually go for for questions. But let me start with one that I I, uh, I thought uh, a few years ago that was very promising and interesting, and maybe you can say a few words on this. In a, I remember there was an attempt to allow wrapping Python code and C code or uh, existing packages coming from mm -hmm. different, uh, for example, physics uh, photonic solvers and call them directly from Julia code. Do you know, can you say a few words on that? And what yeah, uh, so, can be done? Yeah, so, uh, so that's, that's done with the PyCall. Um... Uh, let's see. Okay, so I, I, oh, I need to uh, let me change this to another method. Yeah, so that that's that's done with the PyCall system. Um, I'd have to work on this to find out what the example is there. There is the example in the tutorials that actually gives you out a gigantic rational number. Um, but yeah, so so you can use PyCall um, for for calling into Python. And um, oh, since I don't have it installed, let me just go straight to the documentation for that. If, if you use PyCall though, um, you'll you'll find that it is just uh, the, the syntax we're importing in Python um, is just using PyCall, and you can wrap your PyCalls in, inside of it, these Python strings. So you can basically just say, you know, this is a string which has Python code, and it will then you run this in Python, and it will give you back the result. Um, there's other niceties that are with this. So for example, you can py import um, a, a function from, from you know, Python, and then you can directly call this the, that function. And so you can call any function from Python um, with, with ease. You can also do this with R. You can do this with C++. So for example, the Sundials library, um, you know, sundials.jl, this, this OD solver library, is actually written in such a way that it's actually auto-wrapping the C, C and C++ code. Um, it installs the binary for you, and this wrapper of the full library is, is actually something that's pre-generated, which um, you know it just makes it so that way the whole C++ library is under the hood, just uh, wrapped in such a way that you can be called to it. Yes. So there's a lot of direct calls you can do to C, C++, uh, C++ uh, you know, code and Python code and R code. You just look for, you know, C call, R call, Fortran call, etc. These things will show right up. There's usually no more than one line. Awesome. That's, uh, thanks, Chris. That's, uh, this is uh, super interesting. 
uh, and I, well, we, I, we're actually running out of time, uh, but we'll, we'll take uh, like uh, two minutes for questions if we have some um, before we take a short break. Um, so let, let's, uh, I'm opening the, the floor if anyone wants to ask something quick. Otherwise, we feel free to also catch up with emails and also uh, also write to Chris. I'll, I'll, I don't know, see. Let's see if anyone has questions. Feel free to unmute yourself or to write something in the chat as questions. Otherwise, uh, uh, I have a question. Yep. So uh, I, I didn't. I mean, I don't know if you already said it, but but in the end, is it like uh, what, what, when does compilation takes place? I mean, in the beginning when I run the program or at every step or? So it's the first time that you call a function uh, with, with new types. So the first, you know, so, uh, well, the first time that you call a method, right? So what I was trying to get to here was that a method is the specialized version of a function on a type. The first time that you call such a function, it will be, um, it will be compiled. We, we can, you can actually see this. So if I could make this function uh, h of x, y, you know, 2 x plus y, um, and right, so here I define a function. Um, the first time I call this function, if I do at time h of uh, two three, right, you'll see that um, uh, it should have actually. Or you already had it, or um, I guess I must have already had it. Um, oops. Yeah. Yeah. So h h of so if I do at time h h of two three, then oh. Uh, well, that, okay, so it should actually have more compilation time there. Um, oh, it, it's because it's actually specializing on the, it's, it's sometimes it'll specialize on, on the literal values you put in there. So um, mm -hmm. it's actually optimizing on the fact that I've made this a two and a three. But essentially the, the first time that you call a function, it's going to compile it. The first time that you call a function with new types, it's gonna compile it. Mm -hmm. And the first mm -hmm. time you call this with new types, it's gonna compile it. And if it's I have gonna... loops, mm -hmm. how fast would it be comparing to C or, Py or Fortran? I mean, it, it is if if you have a type stable loop and you have it inside of a function, then it's going to be as fast as your Fortran. You can look can look at the, uh, the at the assembly language you get out of that um, to, to see that. So if I do something like count equals zero point zero for i in one through fifteen uh, count uh, plus equals i, right? And then I output count. Um, so th this is a this is a valid function here. If you do at time h h of uh, HH of nothing, right? Um, uh, to, to do, oh, I didn't want the at time there. So if I do uh, HH, right, then I do HH of nothing, right? So this this that has this output. Um, you see that it uh, that it compiles away. And if you mm -hmm. actually were to look at the, this this code, right? So is the optimizer able to optimize this code? Um, actually is able to optimize it so well that it just spits out the analog solution to this code, right? Mm -hmm. So um, in this case, it is able to go as fast as Fortran because it's able to optimize on this whole loop. If you build more extensive examples, you'll see that it's able to optimize in very similar ways to C or Fortran. And okay. if you're very interested in that, um, take a look at the YouTube lecture where I spent three hours going through exactly how it's compiling and, and all okay. the optimizations you get. Um, but yeah, it, it is no different if you have everything being um, uh, as type stable as possible. And you can also uh, bit fiddle with SIMD and all these things as well, if, if you're interested in that. Okay, all right, cool, thank you. Okay, a final question. I think we have to run uh, forward. Bye. I have uh, one more question, if it's possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was a very nice uh, presentation. Thank you, Christopher. And uh, I want to ask uh, whether it's possible to use uh, Julia to do some uh, symbolic calculations. Yeah, so uh, this, this is one of the things that is fairly recent. So there is um, this library modeling toolkit.jl. I will say this project is not completely done, but um, it is uh, fairly far along inside of the scientific machine learning uh, uh, library set. Um, yeah, so it, so it is a library for symbolic numerics, which is essentially that combination between uh, symbolic computing and numerical computing. Um, so for example, you can use uh, symbolic computing to build faster functions for you. So here's an example of, you define an ODE as a second order ODE, you tell it to lower it to a system of first order ODEs to then call the ODE solver, right? 
Um, but there, there actually is an extensive uh, symbolic computing setup underneath the hood here, where you can, you know, you can calculate the sparsity pattern of. So, I mean, here, here's a few examples, right? So, so one example is uh, you can do LU factorizations of sparse matrices and things like that. Um, but you can also do things like here, here is a Julia function, automatically transform that Julia function into the symbolic form, uh, calculate, uh, calculate the Jacobian of the symbolic version of the, of the Julia code. Um, and the, so calculate the, the symbolic version of it, automatically detect what the, the, um, the sparsity pattern is for the Jacobian of this code and uh, build a direct function that is for the Jacobian. And so here's an example, for example, of doing just that, right? So you can do symbolic calculation on symbols that you define, but you can also do symbolic calculation on code, right? So if you have someone's existing code, you can automatically transform it to the sparse Jacobian and speed up their code by 147 times automatically just by you know symbolically changing their function around. Um, so this is this is an interesting language that kind of lives at a kind of a, a new problem, you know. So so it is a full symbolic system, um, you know, that where you can call simplify and all that, but it also works directly on code, so you can automatically transform people's existing models um, using this 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 kind of. If you're more if you're interested in in, the, in this whole library, um, you could look at the. Um, the Julia Khan talk that I gave on it, automated parallelism, and it's called automated optimization and parallelism in Julia, which is essentially all about how you can how this new symbolic language can automatically parallelize your code. Um, so it's a, it's a symbolic numerics. It's kind of like in in the middle there. But if you're looking for something as like a SymPy equivalent, uh, th this is this is what you get, and it ha it has the relationship to SymPy um, described in there. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So what, what we'll do now um, is uh, we'll, we'll move forward to another part that is a little bit more focused in terms of usage. Uh, Sutapa Ghosh is uh, maybe the first student at the Technion to be a user of Julia. I'm not sure, actually. And we will we'll take a qu quick uh, break before this. It's, uh, Sutapa has about a half an hour uh, presentation. If we will uh, we'll do it, I think we'll do a quick break before. So we'll start at uh, 10 minutes before 5. Okay, so five minutes from now, um, we're still connected. If anyone has other questions or any or any thoughts, feel free to, to interrupt. And we will have uh, Sutapa in the meantime uh, upload uh, her presentation. Uh, Sutapa, you can share the screen, um, but we'll start in, in five minutes. So you can take a, take, take a quick rest or take some time to drink.
Okay. So let's see. Sutapa, is your slide okay? Let's see that we can hear you okay. We can hear you well. Okay. Sutapa, can you share your screen again? Just to see that it's working okay. Sutapa has some technical problems, so she restarted the computer. Oh, hello, um, can you hear me? Yes, but oh, okay. we can hear you. We can not see your screen right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. right now it's not. Uh, I was trying to share, but there was some problem. Uh, okay, now you can uh, you can see, right? Yeah. That's good. Okay. Sutapa so is a PhD student in uh, the group of Professor Gary Eisenstein. Um, she's working in areas of optics, ultrafast mm -hmm. optics, and recently also in quantum mechanics. And I think it will be interesting to see a specific uh, package that Julia has to offer that was, for us, I think a main attraction for using the entire language because it is really well done and has, gives a lot of capabilities for people working in areas of quantum technologies and quantum optics. Uh, so okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Shrutapa Ghosh, and I'm a PhD student here in Technion. Uh, I'm going to give my course talk, uh, which is on uh, on an introduction to a quantum optics toolbox, which is written in Julia programming language. And this toolbox is uh, is used to simulate uh, quantum open quantum systems. So by open quantum systems, uh, I mean uh, that the quantum uh, quantum systems which are interacting with the environment. So this course was actually in the offered uh, last sem no last year by Professor Ido Kaminar. So let's start. So first, I would like to start with I would like to introduce here these people. So actually, they are the developer of this quantum optics uh, toolbox in Julia. So and it is very recently developed in uh, 2018. And here, uh, most of the content from this tutorial is taken from this paper and from the extensive documentation which is available at this site, which is also written by them. Okay, <clears throat> so first I would like to start with an uh, with an introduction and, uh, and an installation procedure. Then I will move to a framework where uh, we can uh, be, we will start with, a, we will see how we can simulate a very simple quantum system. Uh, then we will move to more example in order to understand the different uh, different components of the of the toolbox, and uh, so here the basically in tutorial I will take uh, I mean I will uh, <clears throat> I will go through this step, and after that I will uh, try to explain some of the problems which I was trying to solve during the course, uh, yeah during the course basically. So like uh, one of them is basically to understand the complicated for photon statistics in uh, driven cavity system. Then uh, then to use how we can uh, add time dependent Hamiltonian uh, into the system, which also can be used to uh, study high harmonic generation in atomic system. And also by we will see that by using a similar type of Hamiltonian, we can also address some interesting problems like uh, photon uh, induced near field microscopy. So let's start with an introduction. 
So the Quantum Optics Toolbox is an open source, uh, open source uh, um, toolbox, and which is used, uh, as I mentioned before, it is used to uh, to perform efficient uh, numerical in, uh, calculation for open quantum system. So this toolbox, it offers speed and also it has very good code readability, which means that all the all the syntaxes on all the operators which are defined in this toolbox, they are, uh, they are used in a language which is already well known in quantum optics uh, community. And uh, with this uh, framework, we can basically calculate the time evolution of a system by calculating uh, directly the Schrodinger equation or uh, master, master equation. So before uh, quantum optics toolbox in Julia, we also had uh, other tool. We also have other toolboxes, which are the first one, which was written in MATLAB, uh, and it became very popular because of its uh, easy readability, code readability, and <clears throat> and also because it was the first um, kind of combined uh, quantum optics toolbox, which allows a lot of uh, functionality. So, but this uh, this was not an open source, and also it was a little bit less efficient. It was uh, less efficient than lower level level languages like C, C plus plus, C plus plus. Then, uh, then we uh, basically then uh, there was a there was another quantum optics toolbox which is developed in Python, which was open source. And since it was open source, so there were a lot of active contributors who develop a lot of modules. So it contains basically more features than what was offered in the MATLAB one. But here again, it was uh, 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 here again there was a problem that uh, that for in order to do any time critical calculation, you have to perform it in C plus plus. You have to port the code into C plus plus or other language, and then you have to combine it back into the Python. So for some users, it was a concern, and this problem basically was solved in Julia. Uh, this uh, by this uh, in Julia by using its uh, just in time compilation. So the one which is so the main difference between Python and Julia is that uh, that the way they compile the code, and also in Julia it's uh, recently developed and it is open source, but it became very popular because of this feature. Okay, so I would like to now go into the installation. So we can install Julia from the from the Julia uh, web page, and uh, yeah, and then we can uh, basically use it uh, directly. But also another way to use it, we can add it to the Jupyter Notebook. And here, this link basically will explain you each step, uh, how you can uh, easily add Julia into your Jupyter Notebook. So once we added uh, the Julia to J Jupyter Notebook, we can add packages. Uh, we can install packages first. So with this quantum optics package, it actually come, connects you to the library. And also, there are a lot of other packages which you can install in Julia. So for example, like PyPlot and uh, and uh, <clears throat> PyPlot and other Python, uh, if you're more very comfortable with Python, then you can actually add a lot of uh, packages from Python into the Julia. Um, okay, so at this step, basically your, uh, you, you basically have your uh, Julia install, uh, combined, added to a Jupyter Notebook, which looks like this. And then you, the first step is basically you connect yourself with a library, uh, so uh, yourself with the libraries, which are uh, which is by using these two commands. So so this combines you with the quantum optics libraries, which are written in uh, which are written uh, by in Julia. And then uh, uh, Sudafa. Yeah. I think yeah. we don't see your code. We see still the the PowerPoint. Is it? Um, yes. Currently, we see only the PowerPoint. Okay. Now. Yes. Now you can see, right? Good. Thanks. Thanks, Anif. And uh, you can see this uh, the PowerPoint also, right? Both. Now you see, yeah. Now you, you switch between them exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. So yeah. So this is basically how uh, it looks like. So we first uh, add the uh, add the libraries and uh, sorry the to the libraries and we get connected. So this you have to write in every uh, so in every time when you write a new new code basically. So here first we define it. And then let's uh, move to the framework. So, <clears throat> so in order to uh, in order to under uh, okay, so in order to understand the framework, I would like to start with an example. So here, what I am considering, let's uh, considering a two-level system, uh, system inside an optical cavity. 
so in uh, yeah and so this type of system is uh, is a very well known system and it's represented by james cumming hamiltonian so here what is happening is that you have an atom inside a cavity and the and this cavity has let's say that few photons inside it and then your atom is basically absorbing this photon photon and emitting it so now in order to simulate this system the we can write we can construct the hamiltonian as uh, as the, the set of these three uh, these three set so first is the field hamiltonian because it's a cavity field so it's a quantized so here that's why we put light as a quantized field and uh, where a and a dagger are annihilation and creation operators and then we have hamiltonian for the atom atom system then we have interaction term so since both of them atom and both atom and uh, cavity field are quantized so we write it like this uh, and here sigma plus and sigma minor minus is the ladder operator for atom for atoms and g is the coupling strength so now uh, now since this system uh, ideally uh, <clears throat> so uh, so in practice this system is actually also interacting with the environment right i mean so this is so in order to simulate an uh, simulate an open system we have to consider the effect of environment so how it is in, uh, interacting with environment it's in, uh, interacting by cavity where there since the cavity mirrors are not perfect so there are photon leakage which is given by the cavity decay rate kappa and then uh, also the atom is interacting with environment through spontaneous emission which is given by the rate gamma these two uh, actually adds a loss channel to the whole system so let's for uh, for the time being let's uh, ignore the ignore these uh, decoherences uh, let's ignore these loss channels and we are uh, considering only this hamiltonian uh, so this hamiltonian um, can be uh, so in order to simulate this system we can use uh, since it's a unitary system we can directly calculate the schrodinger equation so in order to uh, do that what we first have to do is that we have to first define a basis so here uh, we have two system atom and cavity so that means we have to define basis for atom and for cavity so for cavity we generally talk uh, for photon we generally use fock basis and for atom we can use a uh, spin half basis which represents two level system or we can also use uh, n level system whatever you are comfortable with so the very first step is to define basis so here we have uh, defined um, fox basis for at uh, for cavity for photon and then this is the for atom then we define our uh, <clears throat> then we define our state so state in terms of basis and this is what uh, here we are defining the initial state so we put our state uh, into coherent state and alpha represents the number of photons inside the cavity and then uh, and uh, we put our atom into a spin down state which means that it is in the ground state so here you can see that the commands which we are using are like fog basis spin basis they are very readable and very understandable if uh, we know all the quantum uh, quantum optics terms so this is what i meant when i said that uh, the code are very readable yeah so uh, so once we have our initial state then what we need to do is that we need to construct our hamiltonian so our hamiltonian is here and this is what we will now write here so this is uh, our hamiltonian and it involves a lot of parameters which are defined here mm, so now once we have constructed our hamiltonian then we want to perform an operation so now here you have to be careful like what type of system you are uh, you are simulating so if you are simulating an open system or a closed system so here for example we have ignored all the decoherence terms so we can just uh, use the schrodinger equation and this is what we did here so it's just one line command so here i am i'm i'm telling the code to calculate the schrodinger equation for me so it's written like time evolution dot schrodinger and you are giving a time span which basically uh, until when you want to calculate the evolution then you are giving the initial state and your hamiltonian so after giving all this information what it gives back is the shy as a function of time now when once you have shy as a function of time you can calculate the expectation expectation um, expe <coughs> you can calculate different parameters by calculating their expectation values so here i have calculated the atomic excitation which represents the the population of the excited state how it is evolving in time and here you can see that this is a famous uh, revival and collapse of the state so what it means is that uh, your atom is basically is absorbing atom then it's reemitting and then again absorbing and this is what uh, what we can see it here so it's a 
absorbing and then it's showing this oscillation then it's emitting back emitting and then it's absorbing again okay so this was our uh, basic code which uh, which we wrote so now if we want to add the loss channels then what we have to use is that we have to use master equation which is written like this and here this leovillian it contains all the all the decoherences uh, the all the dephasings uh, so for example <clears throat> for, uh, for example if we want to uh, add the effect of uh, cavity uh, the light interacting with the environment uh, through this kappa we basically um, we basically define our rate which is uh, so okay so in this case they took the atom interacting with the environment through gamma so gamma is the spontaneous emission rate and since it's on atom so you are uh, telling it to operate on the atomic operator so if you want to calculate for kappa then you will uh, replace here with kappa and it will be act on photon operator which is a so with this information you can basically simulate the whole uh, realistic uh, cavity system another thing what you can do is that uh, if you want to you are not interested in time evolution you only want to calculate uh, what happens at the steady state then you don't need to go through the master equation because uh, the time evolution operator takes time so in steady state it basically only calculated for calculate for a few times so that uh, it uh, make sure that it is at equilibrium and it's much faster and then uh, you just uh, wrote different you uh, use different command which i will mention later so now let's go into details uh, so first uh, step what i showed is that we have to define basis so now depending on your system you choose different basis so for example if you so in previous example we choose uh, we chose spin basis uh, because we wanted to uh, we wanted to represent two level system uh, <clears throat> i mean you can also choose n level system so for example if you have three level system then you will just use this n level basis and then you will uh, you will write your number of levels then photons and all they are mostly represented in fock basis and uh, if you want to represent a particle then you define your position basis and momentum basis and if you have many if you have a large system with many number of atoms then you normally prefer to go to many body basis sorry i would like to just emphasize the n in the fock basis is the number of the levels of or no. the, that is the no. n photon the number of uh, the total size of the fock the fock the fox space fox space that yeah, that, yeah. that okay yeah thank you yeah yeah okay sorry yeah. yeah similarly here the n is actually the particle number and yeah yeah okay uh okay so once you have your basis you write your state so for example in terms of spin basis you can uh, define spin up state and spin down state and similarly these operators they act on these states uh, so these are the pauli matrices and sigma plus and sigma minus are the atom operators so, i mean ladder operators uh, so which we uh, which i also used in the previous example uh, and on the basis of fox uh, sorry on in fox basis you define fox state or coherent state uh and then the operators which you use is the creation operators and uh, annihilation operators then uh, in terms of n level basis you can represent uh, the n level system with the uh, and there you use command like transition which represents your transition from n level to m level uh okay then once you have your state you define the operation so so the if you want to call for schrodinger uh, schrodinger uh, you want to calculate schrodinger equation then you call by using this command you give your time span then your uh, initial state and your hamiltonian and it outputs you the shy as a function of time if you are using a master equation then you give uh, the shy zero again your initial uh, time span your uh, your uh, initial state hamiltonian and j is for the jump operator which uh, jump operator is basically what consider what uh, takes care of this liouville uh, so here in jump operator you give it the rate and you define on the operator and then it automatically calculates uh, the the decoherence term the dephasing term okay and uh, <clears throat> and if you want to calculate uh, the steady state solution then you just write this uh, you don't need to give their initial state i mean you can give the initial state but if you are not giving the initial state that it uh, then it assume that your your uh, your state is at the at the lowest level okay 
So once you have all uh, the time evolution, so once you have like chi as a function of t or uh, rho as a function of t, you can calculate several parameters just by calculating expectation values and all. And also the entanglement, uh, which means that you here you calculate the von Neumann entropy uh, uh, once you have your rho and uh, eigenstates of the system and etc. Okay, so let's uh, move on to different, uh, different examples. Uh, so, uh, so let's consider first that uh, we have a three-level atom system in a lambda configuration, which is interacting with two, class, uh, two classical field. So, so we have a three-level system where the two levels are; these two are the ground state, and uh, and the two light fields they are uh, they are off resonant with respect to the G one E and G two E, uh, with a detuning of delta one and delta two. The, and omega one, omega two represents the Rabi frequency of these two fields. So now uh, the Hamiltonian for this type of uh, system can be modeled as this. So here I have chose that the excited state is at zero energy. So I have only, uh, so in my atoms Hamiltonian, I have only two terms from G1 and G2, the projection operator for G1 and G2. Uh, and this is in a rotating wave approximation. So we have the detunings here. And the second, and this term, it represents uh, it represents the interaction term. So here the field is classical. So omega one, it uh, it is uh, omega one is basically d dot uh, e zero one. So this is the first field here, and uh, the sigmas they represents the transition of uh, transition operation. So here sigma one represents the transition from g one to e, and sigma two represents from g two to e. Okay, so we and so in order to solve this system, we can use a master equation, and uh, here we since our excited state has a finite lifetime, which is a uh, finite lifetime, which is given by this spontaneous emission, uh, spontaneous emission rate, gamma, which and this we will add as a decoherence to the system. So let's see how it uh, it uh, how we can write the code. So for the very first thing we did is we define our basis. So here, since we are talking about three level system, so we are working in a, in a N level basis. So we define it three here, and then we define the atom operator. So transition this command, it, uh, it, exp it, uh, it basically causes, it's a sigma one, a sigma one, which causes the transition from three to one. And, uh, and, the, and we define the projection operator. So projection operator is basically this one. Mm, okay, so then we write our Hamiltonian, which is uh, basically this one, the when we have all the parameters, uh, we write our Hamiltonian. And then in terms of jump operator, we only give it information about our gamma and on what uh, operator it has to act on. So since it's uh, acting on atoms, so we give sigma one and sigma two. Then we define our initial state. So we put our atom into a ground state, which is, uh, which is this one. So here we wrote, uh, one, and then we calculate the time evolution, uh, uh, time evolution by using master equation. So here we gave it, uh, uh, I mean, the time span, initial state, Hamiltonian jump operator, and then we calculated the uh, the expectation value of sigma one dagger sigma one. So which means that the population of the th of the of the ground level, and uh, and similarly we calculate the population of the uh, second ground level and the excited state. So if we look into the result, so if we calculate the population from the master equation, we see that uh, it basically shows the Rabi oscillation. So here, uh, if we remove if we remove the decoherence from the atom, so the phasing from the atom, we see that the population it shows like we started with the with the blue one, which is the G one state, and then it goes down, and then it shows this Rabi oscillation, and similarly the excited state shows the same thing. But then we add the dephasing. And it basically shows that the Rabi oscillation it decays with time. So this is what uh, the population uh, dynamics with time looks like for the three-level atom when it is interacting with two classical field. So now, if we go, if we look into the similar system at the steady level, a uh, steady state, then uh, <clears throat> then we see and uh, and here we put uh, we put the first uh, field resonant with the resonant with the excited state, and uh, we are scanning the detuning of the second field. And then we see, we look into the steady state, uh, state uh, population of the excited state. We see that, and how we calculate it is basically here. 
so for this we don't uh, calculate the master equation we just calculate the steady state uh, steady state solution where we are giving it hamiltonian and our jump operator and for different detuning we are just uh, calculating the similar thing and we see that sorry and we see that uh, at at when we are scanning this detuning at two photon resonance which means when the delta 2 is zero we see uh, the population of the of the third state the excited state becomes zero and this is this well known uh, phenomena called electromagnetically induced transparency which means that there is no atom in the absorbed in the excited state so these uh, the light field which we were we were scanning it becomes completely transparent so this narrow transparent region is uh, basically what we get in this type of phenomena so so what i mean is that by writing this uh, type of simple code in a few lines we can simulate this type of uh, this type of uh, phenomena normally how we calculate uh, this thing uh, without this software we write block equation which comes from this equation and for three level system we get six block equation and then we solve the differential equation and all but here it is very simple to do and it's uh, very time efficient so this is what i would like to emphasize here so let's move on to the next example so here what i want to uh, simulate is the when we put atom inside a cavity so this is a similar situation which we saw before and here we can basically see the revival and collapse of the atomic uh, excitation so this is without any decoherence now we if we add the losses into the system from this gamma and from the kappa then we uh, how we write it is basically here so we again define our basis so the fock basis for uh, photon and the spin basis for atom and we define these operators which is sigma minus sigma plus and the sigma z and we define our initial state then we go into we calculate the time evolution uh, through the master equation and we calculate then the atomic uh, excitation so here uh, in the jump operator or oh, sorry i didn't mention the jump operator so we are defining a a is uh, yeah so we are defining two uh, two operator here so one is the rate so the kappa is acting on uh, the uh, the field operator which is a and gamma is acting on the at the atomic operator and then it is called here in the in the in the time evolution master uh, dot master and then it basically adds the uh, adds the losses into the system and then we can see its effect that uh, the that there is a decay of these uh, revival of the atomic excitation uh yeah sorry yeah so this is what we basically see here okay so now if we uh, so okay so these uh, this basically i i uh, took example from the from the tutorial which is already given in their web page in the uh, web page of the of the of the quantum quantum optics toolbox so now now i will like to move to a specific cases where we uh, calculated uh, we took few systems and we calculated uh, we simulated them so first system which i uh, considered was the driven uh, atom cavity system which is also similar to the james coming uh, coming uh, coming system but with an additional term so here <clears throat> what uh, what we are doing is we have an atom hamiltonian uh, sorry atom hamiltonian then field hamiltonian then interaction term and then we are driving this cavity by, by with an coefficient eta so now we uh, what i want to look here is the photon statistics which means the photon how the photons are coming out through the cavity and uh, in order to see this uh, what we are doing is we are solving the master equation which i shown before uh, and we are adding these two decoherence term from the from gamma and from kappa and then we calculate g2 function so this is a small code which i wrote to calculate uh, the g2 function and if we see that by engineering the parameters we see very interesting effects so for example if we choose this parameter so this is g g is the coupling strength so here the g is the atom light coupling strength and kappa is the is the decay of the cavity so this is basically a bad cavity region and we see that if we are driving very weakly which means that uh, from here if we are uh, we are shining very weak light then we can make this system to uh, to generate only a single photon at a time so which is given so at a particular set of driving parameter we can generate uh, generate anti bunching we can see anti bunching in the photon statistics and this uh, basically 
tells that our photon is a single, it's a single photon source. Now by changing the driving, we can change the photon statistics. And also the very interesting thing happens when we go into an ultra strong coupling region where uh, you can see here the kappa is very small, which means the cavity is the, uh, it's, a, it's a very good cavity, which means it has very high finesse. Uh, so that's why the kappa, the decay rate is a small. So, and, and G is very strong also. So here you can see that the, that first of all, at uh, T is equal to zero, it uh, G2 is very large. And then it shows this type of oscillation. So this type of non-classical features you can uh, you can generate and you can actually engineer the way the photon is coming out from the cavity just by choosing the proper uh, the proper parameter. So here, what I want to say is that these uh, so uh, so so what I uh, did here is I compared the results with these literature. And here in this literature, they calculated these things by with a very in a very complicated way. So by sim, uh, so the Julia, the quantum optics toolbox in Julia, it actually offers a very easy solution to simulate exper experiments. And based on this, uh, these numbers, we can basically uh, <clears throat> we can uh, basically plan the experimental setup uh, quite accurately. Okay, so another thing I I did it was that if we use uh, not if we you calculate the so if we, how can we calculate the photon statistics for a large number of atoms? So here I used uh, two atom I put two atoms into the system, and then what you have to do is that you have to basically change your uh, so you have to add the the spin uh, the state of the second atom here, which you can do like this. But you can just add the uh, the <clears throat> the the sigma z and the ladder up you you get a summation here as well so actually uh, one here i what i would like to say is that so here i use these two uh, atoms uh, i defined them as a separate uh, spin half particle which is not very efficient when i'm uh, when i'm increasing the n when i'm increasing n to a very large value so for that, the one solution would be to go into a many body basis. But once you go into a many body basis, then you have to uh, define your operators uh, operators in the many body basis. And that can be a little complicated, but since it's a well-known problem, so there are a lot of uh, literature about it. Okay, so here I just wanted to reproduce the what they got. So, I mean, you can see that the code still works. I mean, it takes some time, but it works for the, for the large atom system also for n is equal to two also. So another example, <clears throat> what I want to show was uh, how can we calculate uh, time dependent Hamiltonian. So far, the Hamiltonians which we were using was time independent, but uh, here, uh, so uh, I'm considering a time dependent Hamiltonian. So for example, my Hamiltonian looks like this. So here I have an atomic term, uh, atom Hamiltonian, and then I am driving. So, okay, so the system looks like this. So in, instead of my sample, I have a single atom, single two level atom, and then I'm pumping it with a very strong light. And, and then I want to see uh, what is coming out basically from the system. So the Hamiltonian for this system looks like this. So you have a atom Hamiltonian, then you have the interaction term. So here this omega is the Rabi frequency um, and your sigma operators are again the atom ladder operator. And this cos omega t is the carrier frequency of the pump light. And omega, it contains d dot e. e contains the Gaussian profile. Uh, it's uh, basically, it's absorbed in E0, the Gaussian envelope of the pump laser. So in order to, so how can we write code for this? It's again, the similar type of Hamiltonian, except the time dependency. Uh, so here the Hamiltonian, look, uh, we can define Hamiltonian as a function of time. So it's a, it's a similar thing. So here, this is the Gaussian envelope, which has a time dependency and the, the cos, omega, cos mu t term. And then uh, we use a function, which is called time evolution dot Schrodinger dynamic. So this dynamic function, what it does is that it, uh, it updates Hamiltonian at every time. And that's how it calculates. It takes the care of the Hamil uh, time dependent Hamiltonian. So again, you can see that the time dependent effects also we can simulate uh, very easily with, uh, with, with this toolbox. So this is what uh, I got the result basically here, uh, here. Okay, so what here I'm plotting is, so once I have the shy t, I calculate the expectation value of, uh, of sigma 
uh, sigma dagger sigma, which means the excited uh, the population of the, at the excited state, and then I'm doing the Fourier transform. So it tells me the the spectrum. It tells me the frequency component of the atomic excitation. So you can see that the atom is exciting in a higher harmonics, and this is what it will emit uh, when we will when we will analyze the emitted photon. So you can see that it emits depending on your uh, on your omega, which is your which represents your coupling strength, you get higher order uh, harmonics from the system. And uh, this type of system you can basically just simulate uh, in, in very easily here. This is what I want to emphasize. Okay, so the third example what, uh, which I want to show is the photon induced near field microscopy. So here. <clears throat> So here I want to first give a small introduction. So what here, uh, so this is a microscopy tool, microscopic tool, which allows one to perform four dimensional microscopy. So three spatial and one temporal. So here, uh, how it works is that you have an electron source, which is accelerated and then it, uh, yeah. And then it interacts with the light, which is absorbed by the sample, which is actually uh, it uh, it interacts with the near field light, which is uh, which is uh, which is near field from the sample, and then it interacts with it, and it gives rise to uh, this kind of discrete energy spectrum. So here, what is happening is that the sample uh, it absorbs this light, and it uh, so there is an evanescent field across it, and this electron it interacts with it, and this can be used to image image the sample. So for example, in this experiment here, they have a nanotube. So it is, uh, so first an optical field goes through it and it uh, it has this evanescent field which is coming out. Then electron, it interacts with it and it gives rise to this type of uh, energy spectrum, which is analyzed in a spectrometer. And this, by this, you can actually image the system in space because uh, that's how it's coming out. I mean, by tuning the electron, I mean, by tuning the sample and you can image in time. So time, how you are controlling is basically by when your electron, the, by controlling the delay between your electron and the optical excitation. So that's how you can image it in four dimension. Okay, so um, so I uh, con I took uh, this this problem here, which is actually recently published in Edo's group. So I uh, took the Hamiltonian. My Hamiltonian looks like uh, p dot a. So p is the momentum of the electron and a is the light field. So my light field is a is a pulsed laser, and uh, and electron is here represented by this uh, raising and lower operator. So it basically acts on e k and it uh, lowers the spectrum in this direction or in that direction. So it's uh, quantized. And also my light is quantized because here the sample which is used is a photonic crystal. So it's, uh, it gives you the quantized field, the cavity. And uh, yeah, so it acts on N and it gives, it's basically the simple annihilation and the equation operator. Yeah, so then I can write Hamiltonian like this. So here this B and B dagger, as I've said, it's an electron operator and A and A dagger is the light operator. So I can go back to, so this looks like similar to the James Cumming Hamiltonian, except I have, uh, I have the electron state here. Uh, <clears throat> and G is the coupling of, coupling between the electron and the light field. So now if I, uh, okay, so here what I do, so as I said, then the Hamiltonian looks very similar, but here the only thing is that the, our, the electron state, it can be actually go to negative or it can be go to positive. So when we are defining the electron uh, basis, we, so how I defined it is I used N level, oh, sorry, I use N level basis, which has this two N plus one. So where N atom, it uh, by choosing uh, the value of N, I can basically say how many photons I want uh, my electron can absorb. So, and uh, I put that information here. So I basically shift the, the zero point to some number, finite number. And then I try to calculate the electron uh, energy distribution as a function and uh, yeah, energy electron distribution at a particular time because um, yeah, so because I'm calculating the uh, density matrix as a function of time, but then I fix my time and then I see how the electron energy distribution looks like. And I can see that I get a discrete energy and uh, the, the my result basically it looks like uh, I just got it yesterday. Uh, from Alexi, so it looks like this pattern. So basically, I can explain uh, 
I can simulate this type of system also with uh, by using the similar code. Okay, so uh, so with this, I uh, would like to explain my motivation of doing this. So so what I want to uh, want to emphasize here is that we can use like a simple Hamiltonian, and we can actually just by defining redefining our basis or or by writing a simple code, we can simulate very complicated system by using the quantum optics toolbox. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, uh, Sutapa. And uh, for me, uh, actually, uh, amazing to see that we can also apply that for something that Julia and the package was whatever intended for in when we are actually running in the lab. It's, uh, mm -hmm. which is, this is really awesome. We are uh, running out of time, but we will we'll go uh, over a little bit for questions from anyone who's interested. I'd be glad to, to hear uh, questions and ideas because uh, I'm really the, the point of all this for us was to try and bring Julia to be more commonly known in campus. I think it is something that is being uh, uh, now taken by many universities around the world. We see research groups, even leading research groups, developing tools for, for Julia and using it as part of, part of their research. And I think that we should see more of this happening in Technion as well. Um, Anyone who's interested to ask anything, the floor is open. How can we reach uh, this recorded uh, video? Uh, it will be uh, published in the uh, Helen Dealer Quantum Center uh, website as part of, uh, and I think it will be quite useful, uh, quite useful resource to have there. I'll, I'll send everyone, uh, uh, how do we share it actually? Uh, if anyone is interested, uh, send me an email because I will not have everyone's emails here. Uh, but we will uh, definitely have it in the dealer center as a link, and I'll check with the, the with Merab, who's in, who's in charge of this, and uh, make sure to share the list with people in the community in the optics and in the quantum uh, community in Technion. Mm -hmm. For others that are not necessarily part of a specific group and working on this, uh, feel free to write me an email, and we will also share the link. Are there uh, other questions or anything else that you think will be interesting to, to check on or, or hear about? to see uh, the interest uh, and we, we basically had two parts here that were mo one more general and then one more specific for people that are working on more more related to the to the quantum uh, packages um, we'll I think we'll have more people interested in watching the video later so I can think about other groups that may not be necessarily aware of the tools we have here um, we had to uh, run a little bit over time we can uh, we'll, we'll finish in a, in a few minutes uh, I'll stay connected for a few more minutes if anyone is interested in asking anything or if, or if anyone is uh, shy and interesting to hear. Um, I want to thank uh, both Sutafa and Chris again for, uh, for the talks. I'm really glad that we had a chance to do that, uh, even if in Zoom. Okay, we'll, we'll share with everyone the recording here. So, uh, thanks, guys. Uh, I have a question. So where, where do you see Julia going next in terms of like what, what uh, packages or what, uh, what areas of science do you feel are not done well enough in Julia, um, generally or in quantum optics? Chris will know maybe more to say about this. It's, uh... Yeah, so, so um, for, I haven't worked too much in quantum optics, though the, the differential equation solves inside of quantum optics are the thing that I, I contributed to that. Um, so I can give it from that kind of standpoint. Um, there, are a lot, there are a lot of things that, that could be done just for more performance. So for example, the steady state methods could be using uh, pseudo, uh, 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 pseudo temporal methods, right? Instead of doing a flat time stepping like it's doing now. Um, there's also a lot of more SIMD optimizations it could be doing on the um, representation of the browsing cat. So it could probably be getting about 2x to 3x faster on each operation. Um, so so there, there are some more things that, that it could be 
doing just for pure speed. But I think the more interesting thing is more about the scientific machine learning aspects, right? So the, these kinds of things where you can say, I know that my system is going to be evolving with respect to, you know, Schrodinger's equation, but I don't know, and I know the Hamiltonian with respect to some of the quantities, like I know how kinetic energy works and I know this potential, but my potential energy is only an approximate uh, equation. Tell me what the field equation should be and have it spit out the equation automatically for you. Um, these are some of the things that we've been doing with the DiffEQ Flux ecosystem. Though um, I think that we need what we need to do on on our site for SciML is probably help some of the libraries like Quantum Optics adopt this, so that way it has more tools to automatically you know spit out you know missing equations uh, from 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 data, right? Um, another thing that we're really looking into is uh, symbolic numerics, which is this idea that um, we can we can symbolically enhance the um, we can symbolically enhance the numerical functions that you write down. So you you give us a a quantum optics code that you think looks nice, but it's actually not the optimal way to compute it. Um, we can just change your code to be you know parallel and distributed and and sparse and everything, and and then just automatically accelerate it. So th these are some of the things that that I think we're looking into a lot. Uh, you know, automatic discovery of models, but then also automatic acceleration of code. Um, okay. I mean, it's it's definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You mentioned the applications of machine learning to, to physics in the sense of uh, automatic discovery of models, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and th this is a field that we see growing in all groups. Uh, I know different groups at MIT, including, I mean, Marin's group, uh, that are interested in, in doing that, right? So understanding physics by looking at the data and letting the computer do the, to play the role of the physicist, the researcher. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm actually, uh, it's really great to see this happening in Julia, but I'm curious. A step beyond that, it's trying to compete on the machine learning community. That's a much bigger uh, group of people, not a machine learning physics uh, subgroup. Do you think? Do you think that Julia can enter that place, or is this like uh, controlled by the big companies? And TensorFlow will never enter into Julia. Well, I think the the the, the problem there is more so that um, machine learning. Uh, what's a nice way to say it? Machine learning is too easy computationally, right? Um, the, the majority of machine learning is just matrix multiplication. And so there's really not much you can do there, right? Like uh, TensorFlow is going to be as fast as PyTorch, this is going to be as fast as Julia, right? Um, the Flux library is going to just match its speed because it, everything's just calling the same matrix multiplication kernel, so you're just kind of matching it. Um, uh, what, so, so that part is hard, right? When you start doing something like, oh, let's put a neural network inside a Schrodinger's equation. Well, there, you know, you have a Python library which has like RK4 versus, you know, something that has, you know, fourth order, uh, you know, adaptive runga kind of methods, which allows you to use like FOC operators and, and all these things inside of it, where you can put neural networks of FOC operators with, you know, like if you, if you try the, the bras and cats and everything from um, quantum optics, and you put it a neural network mixed with it, the neural network will actually recompile to do the operations on the on the quantum terms. And so quantum machine learning already works, right? Um, and then so you can put- Everywhere where the machine learning algorithms use um, very non-linear, very non-standard uh, usages of those uh, neural networks, it wouldn't be any more, it would be much more valuable to have, a, a, to have Julia. And that's the place you think of. That's why we see machine learning of physics use Julia, but we don't see the hardcore of the machine learning community image processing, let's say, use Julia. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really the composition that 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 is hard, right? So just just doing a matrix multiplication, in, you know, TensorFlow can optimize that. But doing, um, you know, doing quantum optics calculations, but making your neural, making your Hamiltonian be a neural network, right? Now you're defining a ordinary differential equation on complex space with, you know, your own number types like bras and cats and everything, um, and you and you're also putting a neural network inside of there and training the neural network inside of a quantum ordinary differential equation. That thing is difficult. I don't think you can even write that in, in TensorFlow. Um, you could you could write this today with quantum optics. The the, the developers of quantum optics probably don't even know you can write this and that will work. But I know that you can do that. Right? That that's that's the certain aspect of composability kind of leads to this. That is makes it a really nice research environment for scientific machine learning. Um, so I don't know if if it will ever break into. Yeah, I don't know if it'll ever break into standard machine learning, but I mean, at least th this aspect of machine learning where you're mixing it with scientific equations, um, that aspect it's really strong in. Probably also at the core of uh, developing new schemes for all new in neural networks, they're like the, not the users of machine learning, but the people at the core 
that are playing with it, not necessarily for physics. Some of them may also be interested in, uh, like in modifying the like modifying the functions in a more in a more fundamental way. I wonder if there are groups like this. For example, the Techion there is a group working a lot on binary um, neural networks. We are trying to round up everything along the way and work only in binary code. And maybe in places like that, it will also be non-standard for uh, using tensor flow. It's, uh, yeah, I, I, with Julia, if you just make a neural network where your uh, where, where your random matrix is just booleans, um, it should it should just work with flux, right? Um, you can, you can't use a stochastic gradient descent optimizer on that, right? Because it's a discrete space. Yeah, but you just call you, you call jump instead, right? Um, like so, you just compose different libraries together, and, and it will work. And so, yeah, like non-standard machine learning is one of those. I mean, it's, it's, it's why, you know, this organization that for the differential equation solvers and everything is SciML, right? It's for scientific machine learning, which does all this kind of weird stuff, in, which is composing differential equation solvers with neural networks and, and all this weird thing. So. That's why it's great for physicists, basically. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I, it, the, I mean, MIT just did start the IAFIA, -I or I forget the acronym, but the Institute for Physics and AI or something. Um, yeah, so so there there is kind of a big push internationally around uh, around doing this, and a lot of the methods that are being developed are Julia based um, for for this reason because the, that composability is hard to get other places. It's really cool. Yeah. Awesome. So, thanks, guys. Thanks everyone for uh, for joining. It's, uh, thanks for the discussion. It's, uh, I'll see how I'll take the recording from here. Thanks, everyone.